Good morning, good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening, good evening, good evening. My name is John Shaquille Poitier Jr. And welcome back to my podcast, Darling. I'm depressed again. Don't tell my mother. Where we discuss mental health in the youth, the adolescents, teenagers, high schoolers, primary schoolers, middle schoolers, kindergartners, young, old, rich, poor, black, Asian, white, Latino. Listen, once you are a human being, once you are breathing, we have something for you. Now, each episode, we have a certain word that ties everything together, that gives the episode a certain theme, if you will. And the theme for this episode is faith. The theme for this episode is faith. So let's get into it. Darling, do you believe in God? Right. Growing up, I feel like I started every podcast that way. <laughs> Growing up, let me start with something. Once upon a time, long, long ago, once upon a time, not very long ago, I was always fortunate enough as a younger child, to grow up, at least I always thought so, to grow up in a faith-based environment, right? I am a Christian. In case a lot of, in case you may not know, I believe in Jesus Christ. I, you know, believe in God as my Lord and Savior. I try to live a life, a good life. You know, not perfect, but I try. The whole your nine yards and. Growing up especially within the church was an experience unlike any other. And I say that because growing up within a, within the church, and I'm not talking about my specific church, but just within the faith, you could tell when someone had been grown up with religion and when someone had been grown up with relationship, right? You can tell when someone had grown up with the spirituality of it, or when someone had grown up with the routine of it. JJ, what do you mean by that? Let me tell you what I mean. I remember this one specific instance where there was an altar call at a church, and this guy didn't want to grow up. I, I, I could tell he didn't want, he didn't want to go up. He he just, you know, he, he was fine. He was just sitting there. And, you know, I saw his grandmother push him, push him to go up, like push him, tell him, go up there, go up there now, right? And he didn't want to. I saw him go up because she, you know, told him to go up, but he didn't make that choice for himself. And I thought about that so often. I thought about the reason why it happened like it happened because she had good intentions for sure. Because at the end of the day, she just wants her grandson to be saved, right? She just wants him to accept God, accept Jesus. Okay, perfect. However, despite the intention, the way in which it was carried out, to me, to me, was a bit off, right? And let me tell you why I say that. I've always had the understanding that the choice to be in a relationship with God, the choice to believe in God, the choice to be saved was indeed a choice, an execution of free will given to God by man. A maybe. You have the choice to do it or you cannot do it. You can believe in what you want to. And I believe that's the case with any religion, with any belief. Hinduism, Islam, anything, you have the choice to believe in what you want to believe in. Right? And if you never had a choice to believe, then do you really believe in it? That's always been the question in my mind when I think about that specific instance. Because here we have a young kid. He doesn't want to go up. His grandmother forces him to go up. And I think in the back of my head, does he truly believe if this wasn't his choice? And that set me on a tangent of people researching and reading and learning about people who had so much religious trauma simply because the choice to believe was never their choice, right? They grew up in the church and they grew up with God, but they didn't get to know him personally. They just got to know routine. They just got to know about the 
ritualism of it all. The communion, the kneel down and pray, sing the hymns, go home and raise hell. All right? So when it comes to faith, it's such a mental health, indeed. It's a very, very, very sensitive topic because a lot of times people who were once within the church and are no longer within the church for their own reasons, of course, there may sometimes be an, a feeling of anger, a feeling of anger or a feeling of being upset which is which is justified at members of at the church, the institution itself, because they feel as if they never had a choice. And in not having that choice, it pushed them far, far away from the institution itself, which is extremely understandable. It is. Because when you deny someone the right to choose something that's life-altering, when you deny someone the right to say whether or not they want to do something, then you are taking away one of their basic human rights, right? You are taking away their voice. And I say this as a person who believes in God, who believes in Jesus, who believes, you know, the son of God, I would love, I would love for nothing more than for someone to believe in God. I would love for nothing more. However, if you choose not to, I cannot force you to make that choice. And I will not force you to make that choice because that's really not my place and that's really not right for me to do. And religious trauma is based on that. It's just based on a denial of the choice, a denial of the forced choice, right? Because the choice was forced. And so that person then recoils and recoils away from that and just completely abandons the concept altogether. And it makes me wonder how many people would actually believe in something, believe in a faith, if they were taught to have a relationship and not to practice routine, right? Because I see it as a Christian, I see it almost every day, where there are people who says, this is in the Bible and that is in the Bible. And it's not in the context in which they used it. And the, and the, the simple thing to do would be to argue and say, oh, you don't understand. Da, da, da. The simple thing would be for me to argue. However, I have to be understanding of the fact that not everyone has that relationship. And not everyone has gone into the Bible or a religious text with the analytical thinking that is required in order to have a foundational relationship with God. I had to consider that. So when I see people who say these things about the Bible or say these things about God or whatever the case might be, I don't feel angry and I don't feel, you know, a sense of pity or what's not. I don't feel anything like that. What I feel is an obligation, if they are willing to, an obligation to just politely inform them, if they are willing to hear what I have to say, of course, of to the full context of what they're referring to. to, to politely inform them to do it with love. And I believe that if so many more Christians, if so many more people who called themselves Christians did that, the world would be such a better place. Such a better place. Because there is a massive lack of accountability for the role that people who call themselves Christians, notice I'm not calling them Christians, people who call themselves Christians play when it comes to the current state of society particularly with marginalized groups. There is such a massive role that people who call themselves Christians, and I'm going to tell you why I keep saying people who call themselves Christians, and I'm not actually saying Christians, there is such a massive role that they play. Because a lot of those types of people can be very judgmental. And cruel-hearted. A lot of those types of people can be very, very cruel-hearted. 
And I am not a one to judge anyone's walk with God. I only know what I can do and how I view a Christian, how I view myself as a Christian, how I, what I understand a Christian to be is someone who loves their neighbor as they love, as they love themselves. And someone who treats people with the utmost kindness and the respect as they want to be treated while maintaining that relationship with God and letting the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the vindication of the Holy Spirit and all of those things rest upon them. That is what I view a Christian as. So, but if I see you yelling at people and judging people and hating people and despising people, it, it, it in my head, I go, I see why a lot of people dislike Christians or so-called Christians. Because if someone tells me that I'm going to burn in hell, if someone tells me that I'm going to die a lonely, miserable death, if someone told me something like that, but they claim to be a person that's loving and who serves a God who is just like them, I would wonder what type of person that God that what type of God that person served. That's the thought that would be in my head. What type of God do you serve that would tell you to tell me that I'm going to burn in hell? What type of God do you serve that would tell you to tell me that I am worthless and unworthy of love? So when I say I am understanding of people, I understand people who have been traumatized by religion, who have been traumatized by the, by many people who claim to love God, but in actuality love their own self-interest, who are cruel, who are just gigantic jerks, to put it plainly. I understand exactly why that would push you away from religion. With that being said, however, one bad apple does not necessarily in this case spoil the whole bunch there are christians out there there are genuine christians out there who are loving who are kind who are welcoming who will be wonderful to you there are genuine true christians out there who are christ like minded people who are genuinely god fearing people who will who actually have your best interest at heart and if you have experienced anything contrary to that when dealing with Christianity, then I am so sorry that you had to go through that. But I'm letting you know what it actually is. There are people out there who want to see you do well in life, who want to pray for you and wish you well, and who want the best things for you. There are people like that out there. And the issue is the people who are, who are not like that, the people who give Christians a bad representation, who give Christians a bad name, you know, the people who are the most hateful, the most bigoted, idiotic types of people are usually the ones that represent the whole of Christianity, right? Those, those become the poster child children for Christianity. So those are your people. And from those people, the world creates an an image for Christians. The world creates an understanding that all Christians are like that. I promise you, all Christians are not like that. All Christians are not like that. They are not. And like I said before, I am not. To, I am not anyone to judge a person's walk with God. I cannot judge what you are doing with your walk with God. But I know what I practice, which is. Believing in God, believing in the Holy Spirit, reading the word and trusting in the Holy Spirit to convict me when I need conviction and to show me how to love others as I need to be loved. And growing with God. That's literally the entire gist of being a Christian, actually. Quite literally, that's the entire scheme of it. That's the real deal. That's just, that's just what it is. And uh, that... A lot of people add on responsibilities when it comes to Christianity. They add on responsibilities. So they are no longer just the Christian. They are now the God. They are the priest. You have to tell them what you did wrong. 
right? You have to confess to them so that they can forgive you for what you did, right? There is so much that goes into religious trauma and the dealings behind it. And for me as a person of faith, I have been, and I currently am so fortunate to know what it is to have a relationship, a relationship with God, a relationship. And let me tell you exactly why I say that. For example, right? There's something small. I got earrings. I have a nose piercing. Boom. Boom. Off the bat. Off the bat. You have some people who tell me I, I'm going to hell. I have a Jezebel spirit. I am a child of Satan. A child of the devil. I am all these different things because I got three pairs, I got these persons, right? You have people who would tell you those things. You have people who would tell you that you are unworthy of God's love, that you you don't look like a man of God, that you are not a man of God, that you don't deserve to call yourself a man of God. You have people who will tell you those things based on your appearance. Yeah. That's really encouraging, right? And do you know what I did? You know what I did? I kept the piercings in. Not to prove a point to them, but to tell myself something. If God did not convict me through the word or in my spirit, then you cannot do that for him. A lot of times people want to get convicted for something that you are. You may have a tattoo. They're saying, how you call yourself a child of God and you have tattoos? You're getting convicted for that person. God didn't tell that person. God didn't convict that person. The Holy Spirit didn't convict that person. The Word didn't convict that person. A lot of Christians love to place themselves in the seat of judgment. A lot of so-called Christians, I should say, like to place themselves in the seat of judgment. Whereas they are the ones who govern. They are the ones who decide what is acceptable in God's standards, what is not acceptable, what can go before the throne, what cannot go before the throne. So because someone has piercings or dyed hair or has this lifestyle or whatever lifestyle, they are not worthy to go before God. That is the thinking. That is the thoughts in the minds of a lot of people who call themselves Christians. You have to be a certain way. You have to look a certain way. You have to present yourself a certain way to go before God. Eons ago, black people weren't considered good enough to go before God. <laughs> they weren't considered good enough to go before God. Now, we have moved on. So now it's the way someone looks. Now it's how many persons they are. Now we cast judgment on how someone looks and all of these things that they have on them and in them. And we cast so much judgment on a person who is trying to improve their life and do better and be better. And we are stumbling blocks in their way because we want to have an ideal of what a Christian should look like, how a Christian should be, what a Christian should be when God is the one who set that out, when the word is the one who set that out. But we want to remove the word and replace the word with tradition that is based on man-made concepts and not on the spirit of God. We would rather tradition operate the church rather than the Spirit of God. We allow tradition to operate. We allow what we feel is right instead of what God feels is right to operate. So if a mother has a child out of wedlock, oh, she needs to be removed from the church. Right? She needs to be removed from the church. Instead of we should pray for that mother, and we should em still embrace her in the fold. Do you all see what I'm saying? There is so much to unpack when it comes to the faith. And how it has been misused and utilized to oppress people.
and I I despise it actually when the thing that is meant to set people free, the thing that is meant to liberate the mind, the soul, the spirit, is used to oppress a person, is used to restrict someone or bring harm to someone. It's my least favorite thing in the world. Which is why going back to the story I told earlier about the guy and his grandmother, I want someone to believe because they chose to believe. Right? Go in the church. I grew up in the church, but my parents never said to me, you have no choice but to believe in God. They never said to me, you must sit down and you must believe in God or you could burn in hell. They never told me any of that. They let me be in the environment and they let me experience it for myself and they let me make that decision on my own. They never forced that on me. It was never forced on me. Whether or not I would believe, whether or not I would just not, it, it was never forced on me to believe in God. I chose to do it because they allowed that relationship to blossom naturally. That's why now, even in college, as a college student, I still have a relationship with God. I still do my daily devotions. I still pray when I need help, when I don't need help, just to talk to God, just to interact with God, just to uh, for, ask for forgiveness, just to ask God to help me to forgive people. I have that relationship. A lot of parents are like, when they see their child go abroad, you know, they're like, oh, I raised you differently, and I raised you to believe in God, and I raised you to do this and raised you to do that. Question. Did you force your child to believe in God, or did you teach your child how to have a relationship with God? Because if you forced your child to have a, to believe in God, let me tell you something. The second that child leaves from your roof, they are going to go on a complete tangent from what you wanted them to do when it's forced it's just like growing ill in school we wasn't allowed to grow our hair beyond what an inch two inches when guys go to school everyone start growing their hair because why we couldn't do it our whole lives a person a child is forced to believe in god their whole life the second they get out from beyond that that umbrella they begin to go buck wild why is that? And I'm not saying because the Bible says to train up your children in the way that they should go. I am not saying do not teach your children about God. What I am saying is teach your children to have a relationship with God, not to follow the routine of religion. I'm going to say it again. Teach your children to have a relationship with God, not to follow the routine of religion. And I feel like I'm about to get in trouble for what I say, for what I'm about to say. The reason why a lot of people struggle with their relationship with God is because it's based off of fear, not out of love. A lot of people are more afraid of going to hell than they are in love with God. And I feel like I'm about to get in trouble for saying this too. It is my belief that as a Christian, for me, it is important that I am a Christian because I love God, not because I'm scared of going to hell. Ooh. I can just feel someone rowing me or rowing me or emailing me to tell me something about myself, but that's the truth. For me as a Christian, it's more important for me that I love God than I fear going to hell. The foundation of my relationship with God is love. I am obedient because I love God, not because I'm scared of hell. Right? Keep in mind, I don't want to go to hell. Never want to. Never want to try to. Don't even want to, don't even want to attempt. That's just not my thing. But I, because I love God and I care about God and I want to genuinely be close to God and cling to God, I work on being obedient. I work on being a loving person. I work on being a kind person. Not because I'm scared of hell. And we train children to believe in God because they don't want to go to hell. Instead of teaching them to love God because he loves us back. 
I'm sorry, someone not to say it. I am so sorry. We train children. I'm going to repeat it once more. In case you didn't catch it the first time. We train children to have a relationship with God that is based off of the fear of going to hell rather than the love and overwhelming goodness of God. Therefore, when you see someone struggling with their relationship with God, struggling to believe in God, when they have been told their entire life that if they don't, they will go to hell, a major reason for that is because they never had a firm foundation to begin with, because from the get-go, you never taught them about the true love. Instead, you taught them about the fair. Ouch. Thank God they're saying in person because I hope a lot of Bahamians will be mad at me for that. A lot of Bahamians will be mad at me for that. But it's the truth. It's the truth. I do what I do because I love God. Even in a relationship, okay? Let's, let's say a relationship with another person. Let's say you're someone's friend, right? Would you do something for that person because you love them? Or would you do it because they are, you're afraid they might leave you? Or you're afraid that they might let you go off and do your own thing? When you are in a romantic relationship, right? Let's say you're in a romantic relationship. Do you do something for the person that you are with because you love them? Or do you do it because you are afraid that they might hurt you or they might leave you alone? Why do you do it? And if you are doing something for someone because you are afraid that they will leave, rather than the fact that you love them, then something is entirely wrong. Woo! Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And that can cause such chaos inside the mind. When you have this turmoil, this battle inside of you, something saying, I don't want to believe, but if I do believe, I'm going to be compromising myself. Because I'm a person, it's, it's going to feel natural for you to believe in God. It's going to feel natural. Right? It has to feel natural. It has to feel like something organic, something that's grown there, something that wants to be there. It isn't going to be something that causes you emotional stress and emotional damage. It won't. It just won't be. God isn't a God of chaos. God isn't God is a God of order. He does things in orderly fashion. He does things in an orderly manner. So if your relationship or if you believe in God and you feel as if it's stemmed in chaos, I hate to break it to you, but something got to change, buddy. Something got to change. And that's scary, and it's a very scary thought to have, especially when you're sitting down and you're thinking, I, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to burn in hell for all eternity. I don't want to be best friends with the devil sitting, sitting pizza, drinking Radler. Drinking lukewarm rattler in the pits and deepest pits of hell. I didn't want to do that. But I've been forced to believe in God and I don't know God. So I feel like I don't know him at all. That is one of the most difficult battles to have. And that's something that can cause someone to lose their head, to lose their mind, their concept of how they understand things, how they understand their own spiritual well-being, how they understand their mental well-being. That can be so damaging. When you believe, when you tether yourself to a belief, a faith, to a foundational system, you must actually believe in it and what it stands for. Meaning you must actually have an understanding, a relationship with it. You must be, you must be deeply in touch with your spiritual side. Because faith isn't just a thing of the mind. It's a thing of the spirit. You feel it. You feel it in your body, in your emotions, in everything you do and you interact with. You feel this force, this strength moving through you. In my belief, that is. That's what I believe. You feel it. I know I feel it. So if you don't feel that, 
if you don't feel as if you truly have that relationship, you have to dig up that foundation and start again. Start with what you think you need. Start with what you think you need and go from there. Talk to God. Talk to God honestly. Have an honest conversation with God. If you, I encourage you, if you feel as if you are over everything, you just don't want to do the church no more, you just don't want to do it, okay, then go in peace and, you know, just be good. But I encourage you, before you do that, just have one conversation with God. Say everything and anything on your mind, everything and anything on your heart, and let him hear you. Just say it all. Say it all. Don't filter yourself. Don't filter what you... Don't say it how you think he wants to hear it. Say how. Say it how you're thinking it, because he already know what you're thinking anyway. Just say it. Say it all, and just let it flow out. Try that, and you never know. You never know. Well, this has been Darling, I'm Depressed Again, Don't Tell My Mother, and this has been our episode on faith. Thank you for being here, and I will see you all next time.